Moore is going to lead us in an opening prayer. Go ahead, David. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight with thanksgiving that we can all be here and we can partake of your word and what you have to say to us tonight. And we ask you to really open our hearts to uh, your will and what you want us to do throughout the day as we live our daily lives. Let it always be your will that we do and say, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Sorry about that. Mute and then drop the mic, right? That, that works a little better. Okay, so um, we are just at week two, obviously, and we're going to look at James 1, verses 12 to 18. And and I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing with God's word, and I, I know we all have had this happen to us before, but I just, I could not believe how rich these little verses were. I mean, the whole Bible is rich, but uh, in the book of James, we know how uh, rich it is and how practical it is, but it really became alive uh, to me again uh, during this past week for verses 12 through 18. So, and specifically the, on uh, uh, Monday and yesterday, as I did most of the prep. And um, just really, really uh, intense. We could spend a lot of time on verses 12 to 18. And um, it, it's just really, really neat. And I really, really uh, enjoyed that. Let me let someone else in the room here. All right. So I do want to uh, just dive right in. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the word blessed for a little bit. And then we are going to uh, sing a couple songs. And then we'll go into the rest of the text. So... Um, right off the bat here, we looked at verses 1 through 11 last week, and the Christian's uh, empowerment from God to be able to withstand different trials, different tribulations, different things that might come at us in life. And then this verse 12 is really a transition. Some people lump it in with verses 1 through 11. Some people put it with 13 through 18. Obviously, it all goes together. It's all part of James' letter, and it's his transitional uh, verse, really, uh, between these uh, two little sections, which I don't even know if he meant for them to be sections, but it, it works well for us as a transition verse. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love it. So obviously we could do a quarter on this verse, but just absolutely full of great theology and great practical application for us. And some of the practical application will come in verses 13 through 18, and then of course throughout uh, the whole letter. But let's focus first of all on the word uh, blessed. And this idea, uh, there have been a few translations in the past that have put happy uh, in their translations for blessed. And it's true that a blessed person probably will be a happy person, but not for sure. You know, obviously we're told that we're being blessed if we're persecuted for righteousness sake uh, by Jesus. And we'll look at that in just a second. So being blessed is not exactly uh, being happy, of course. Being blessed is the fact that God has poured out his blessings into our lives, into our, our very beings. And so, yes, that should make us have the joy of the Lord, but joy and happiness, happiness and blessedness, uh, the, the happiness is kind of a, a separate thing, uh, may or may not take place. And so uh, you may be someone who has had just hit after hit after hit through life. On Tuesday mornings, we're studying the book of Job, talk about someone who definitely took hit after hit after hit uh, in chapters one and two. Uh, I mean, he could not get a break, and, you know, he was in a tough time. He was not happy uh, during that little stretch uh, of time, that is for sure. Uh, but he would look back and say he was blessed, and the Bible describes him as one uh, who is blessed. And so, uh, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Uh, someone who can do that is someone who 
is blessed and has been blessed and will continue to be blessed by God. Uh, this kind of gets back to our uh, foundational lesson for spiritual strength. It gets back to our first lesson on the letter to the Ephesians. It gets back to last week in this class. God is the one who is just pouring out his grace into our lives. And even when times are tough, he is doing that. He is pouring out the blessings. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, Greg describes him as one who never had a good day on the job. Um, I don't know how often Jeremiah would have felt happy. Uh, not too often, uh, but he would have known he was blessed uh, by God. Uh, but in the middle of the book of Lamentations, the five chapters of laments, right in the middle in chapter three, he says, oh, you know what, though? This I call to mind. I mean, the world is falling apart around him. Jerusalem's falling apart. The temple's falling apart. I mean, people are being taken away. He's, of all places for a Jew, heading back to Egypt. I mean, things are not good. And he's able to say, you know what? This I call to mind and have hope. Even Jeremiah had hope. And he was able to express that to uh, the captives in Babylonia in his in the letter to the exiles um, and so here blessed is the man we want we need to realize that we are blessed people in Jesus Christ um, uh, Ephesians 1 3 uh, which Landon uh, covered this past Sunday night blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ so thanksgiving to him let's pour out our honor to him who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God is the one who does it, and so we respond. We give thanks to him. We give praise to him. We bless him in our way because he has blessed us in Jesus Christ. And then the Beatitudes. Normally I put verses 3 through 12, but I just I couldn't stand it uh, to leave out 1 and 2 just to make kind of a side point. Notice, and it, it's, a, it's a picture of God himself, God Almighty, God the Father, and the Spirit as well, even though here, of course, it's God the Son. Seeing the crowds, he saw them. And we're told about this in Scripture in the New Testament. Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion on them. He saw people. One of our great downfalls in our culture probably are people not seeing people. And one of the things that's happened in the last year, you know, I've, I've, I've been to Kroger a few times the last few days, people don't make eye contact like they used to. I mean, I, I'm one of those people that makes you uncomfortable in the grocery store because I, because I look at you. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but now people aren't looking at all. And uh, it's just so sad. I can't, I can't wait, you know, for most of the population to be vaccinated. I can't wait to the point where the masks are off, and I think people will start looking. I just think it's, there's, it's not shame. Obviously, you know, we have a mandate. We're, we're told to put the masks on, but there might be something about a mask that, that causes people to not want to make the eye contact. I don't know. I would, well, that'll, be, that'll be studies for people getting lots of government money at universities that we'll read about 20 years from now. But, uh, and we'll have to pay for it, of course. Oh, we'll be paying for it. Yeah, yeah, that's my point. <laughs> yes. So, um, but, you know, there might be a little bit of shame that just kind of automatically happens with the mask. I, again, I don't know. But Jesus saw people. And with this seeing, it's not just physically seeing. Obviously, here he saw them, went up on the mountain, sat down. and But he saw people. He saw people the way all of us who are Christians should see people from a different perspective, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17. You know, we look at people from a different point of view. Uh, we try to do it like Jesus did. Yeah, Jay, go ahead. Well, I think part of it might be an unconscious desire to try to avoid people. Because oh, sure. Yeah. Free, so you're going to get it for so-and-so. You're going to get it yeah. for so-and-so. So you go down the other side of the aisle or you go, and... I, I'm actually not worried about that, but I do it also because I think I, the perception of people who think people want to get it from me. And yes. Other people may be doing the same thing, but you don't know, look at somebody and you're trying to avoid it like that. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. I think that's part of it. And, and probably you guys online could hear most of that, but Jay was saying, you know, part of that is just, 
Well, you're close enough to the mic is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the, um, but yeah, people are just, we are in a mode of avoiding people. Yes, that, that is absolutely true. So, and, and that's of course too bad. But notice the other thing here, and this is what God has done ever since Adam and Eve. This is what God has done. And of course, Jesus is God the Son. This is what God has done since he created people in his image. He opened his mouth and he taught them. And I just think that's cool. So anyway, a little bit of a side point. Like I said, I deleted 12 slides, so we're going to be all right. Um, they were just slides I hadn't deleted from last week, to be fully honest. But still, it's kind of exciting. Um, okay, so here are, the, here are the people who are blessed. These are the people that Jesus says right at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, when you are this, you are blessed. Blessed are these people. And, and here's part of the blessing. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are you. Blessed are those, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So James, and a lot of parallels between, well, all the writers and Jesus teaching, but particularly with James, it's almost like uh, as his brother, he wanted to make up for those unbelieving years, perhaps. Uh, or maybe he was a lingerer. Maybe he was someone who was around a lot of the teaching, but just wasn't buying it. I mean, we don't, we don't know, but obviously he was inspired and a lot of parallels, and he's saying, blessed are you when you stand firm, when you're able to be steadfast through the troubles. And the troubles we looked at last week, and again, like I noted last week, the word for trials being used up in verses 1 through 11, it's the same exact word that's being translated temptation in 12 through 18. Uh, there, there is no difference there. They've just changed it because of our English subtleties um, concerning these words. Uh, 1 through 11, more of the outward stuff that happens, the, the stuff we might call random, uh, the stuff that just kind of happens because we're in a fallen world. And then in 13 through 18, of course, we're going to see that tonight that, you know, we bring some of these things upon ourselves. We still have to be uh, steadfast. So blessed is the man who remains steadfast uh, under trial. Present and future connotations was supposed to come up at the end, but now you get to see it already. There are present and future connotations with a lot of the things talked about in the New Testament. Um, and with blessings, it's absolutely true. Um, and concerning the, the crown that we will receive right in this verse, we're told, is part of that. Uh, right now we're blessed, but we will certainly be blessed uh, later. The idea of being blessed in the Old Testament, um, you were blessed if you were wise. Uh, you were blessed if you were one who would seek God's forgiveness. Uh, wise, I mean, uh, blessed, uh, the people who do justice are blessed. The people who live the way God wants them to live, those are the wise people, those are the blessed people that we read about uh, in, in the scriptures. Um, all right, so now let's, uh, before we sing uh, uh, Count Your Blessings, uh, which Landon did bring up Sunday night, um, a good exercise for us to do uh, when we uh, have the time or the, or the uh, ability to do that. But before that, any comments uh, online or here? Yeah, Jay, go ahead. Talking about James, he's not far about this. And I'll just read John 21, so you can kind of make me think of it. Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, talks about the resurrection appearance. Of course, I knew this, but it says, then he appeared to Jay. That's yeah. like, huh. I mean, he, he made a special appearance to his brother. Yeah. Why? I don't know. But, and 
so that it's some of them. But it's, it's just kind yeah. of crazy because in the other context of the appearances, they weren't, you know, he might not have seen him. So he, whatever the situation, he appeared specifically to James. So. <laughs> And even if there might have been other people, Jay, for those of you online, if you couldn't hear, just made a point, you know, the, the Corinthian letter makes a point that Jesus appeared to James, you know, 400 or 500, whatever the number is there, then the, you know, different people named big groups, and then James, he is singled out. It's really, really cool. Yeah, Bill? He should have gotten an outline for his book. <laughs> yes, that's, that's what Jesus handed him. You know what? You need to write this letter, James. <laughs> yes. Uh, but James was a leader. He was a, you know, a, a, he had influence uh, in the Jerusalem church. He had influence, especially among um, Jewish Christians. Oh, when Jesus made his appearances. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. All right. So here's where I was going to bring in uh, that last uh, uh, present and future connotations. And that's where we uh, move into talking about uh, the crown of life. Uh, throughout scripture, this uh, descriptive kind of use of these words, uh, sometimes the victor's crown, sometimes an ornament of honor, uh, sometimes uh, kind of like a, uh, just a wreath put on someone or a necklace put on someone just to just to show them honor. They may not have won a race or anything like that, or they may not have been of royal blood, uh, but it did show honor. And of course, uh, royal crowns are talked about. The, the crown of life here is a sign and a mark of honor. Um, and that, and, and, and victory, of course. Uh, Greg was talking about a sister uh, who uh, played tennis and had a lot of awards and uh, trophies and such. And those things are perishable reeds. Those things are perishable signs of the victories. Uh, but the, the eternal uh, crown, the eternal uh, wreath is one that will uh, never perish. Um, it is something that will last forever. It is amazing to me. And this is because of, of what happens at our baptisms. This is because we are in Jesus Christ, and we have received his spirit. We are the temple of the living God, individually and as the church, as a whole. And it is unbelievable to me. And Hebrews reminds me of the honor uh, that is bestowed upon us. And of course, it's not deserving honor. It's honor because we're in Christ. It's honor because of what Jesus did, that he took the, the cost. He took our sins. He took all our blemishes uh, upon himself uh, to, to take care of that for us. But in Hebrews, we're told that God is not ashamed to be our God, and Jesus is not ashamed to be our brother. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers. And that has always, well, when I first noticed it, I think I was out of high school even. I might have been a senior in high school or maybe in college when I first really noticed that. And it kind of just, it kind of blew me away. Um, uh, you know, we, we, well, teenagers, right? We all kind of deal with, you know, what's my worth, self-esteem, self-worth, all those kind of things going through your mind. And it was like, wait a minute, God's not ashamed to be my God. I'm kind of ashamed just to be around, <laughs> but, uh, but God's not ashamed and Jesus is not ashamed to call me his brother. I mean, those things, that's pretty amazing. And, and so it is that, uh, but also, uh, it is a mark of the behavior that leads to eternal life. And again, this is no statement of earning salvation, but this is James' way, and we'll get to this with faith uh, and works when we get to that here uh, in the book of James. He's not contrasting the same thing Paul was. Uh, they're not in conflict at all. But when someone is saved, there is a transformation. There's a change. Faith means something. Jesus saving us means something. The Holy Spirit living in us means something, and the Bible is not shy about saying it should be evident. The fruit should be appropriate. And so James will talk about that concerning the tongue. He'll talk about it throughout this letter. So, so this, this crown of life, and notice God has promised it to those who love him. The same uh, little phrase there concerning the ones 
to whom God will work all things together for good. It's not that God is going to work all things together for good for everyone in the world. It's for those who love him. He's working things out and moving things and shaking things, uh, taking into account people's raunchy decisions and taking into, into account uh, the, what we call the randomness of a fallen world. Um, he's taking all those things and he's working everything together for good for those who love him. And I think that's only a, a gracious, all-powerful, good God would be able to do that. Bad stuff should lead to more bad stuff. But God is able to take bad stuff and bring good out. Of course, the ultimate example is Jesus uh, on the cross, uh, where he did that in, in the most, uh, obviously, amazing uh, way. So, and you're like, finally, verse 13. <laughs> I'm just joking with you. No, that's, the, that's, that's probably the real meat here is verse 12, this transitional verse. But I hate to even say that because obviously when you see 12 through 18, I mean 13 through 18, um, absolutely incredible as well. So this God who is the all-gracious one, this God who is the all-powerful one, this God who is, is working these things and blessing us. Blessed is the one who withstands under trial because that person is going to receive this crown of life with immediate blessings in this life and, of course, eternal, um, eternal blessings that will last uh, forever. So this God, James is saying, okay, let's not, let's not mess with his character. Let's not say things that are untrue about him. And he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Proverbs 19.3, though, says that human beings are going to be tempted, no pun intended, to blame God. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, notice it's, a, it's, the, it's this man's folly. It's his own ridiculousness, whatever he's involved in, if it's sinful or just haphazard um, lack of proactiveness in life, whatever it might happen to be. When a man's folly as opposed to a man who is wise, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, when it all crashes in, his heart rages against the Lord. Obviously, that should not be. But Solomon's pointing out, or anyway, Solomon, will all, he didn't write the whole book, but anyway, uh, the, the, the one writing this proverb says, his heart rages against the Lord. This is a tendency of human beings. And James is saying, you know, this is, this is not uh, acceptable. Let no one say that. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. There's, a, there's an idea here of, of nurture. And, and I don't want to take anything away from the fact that any sin we commit is a sin. Uh, but James definitely here is, seems to be going through a, a progression. So there's, the, there's this temptation, there's this luring, there's this enticing. And the person doesn't just say no right then, like the person should. Uh, like Jesus did. Satan was tempting him in the wilderness, and Jesus, well, he, he quoted scriptures back at Satan, and then, of course, Satan tried that trick. Uh, uh, not that trick, but Satan tried it. For him, it was a trick. Satan tried, oh, okay, he's quoting scripture. I'll quote one back at him to try to get him to sin. Then, of course, Jesus wasn't going to fall for it. Jesus, of course, is our perfect example of the one who is able to say no. Anytime he was tempted— it is important for us, I think, when we contemplate temptation, to realize that Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. I know if I'm, I mean, we're tempted all the time, I know in various ways, but sometimes when I'm tempted, I feel guilt for even being tempted. And, you know, that's, that's not an acceptable uh, place to be. Um, what that probably means is I did sin, and so the guilt is appropriate, or that I just have a weird, twisted view of what, what the Bible expects. 
And Jesus was tempted. He was tempted in every way as we are. And I know, for me, that's still hard to get my mind around because I still kind of have this, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, Gene Carroll never taught it. Greg never taught it. Uh, the elders here never taught it. But I still have this little thing of kind of believing somewhere in my heart that if I'm tempted, I've sinned. Um, and again, all we have to do is look at Christ and know, okay, that, that cannot be true because Jesus did not sin. Um, and so, you know, we, and this, you may just all think I'm crazy, which is fine. Um, that's an issue I'm dealing with, but maybe some of the rest of you have dealt with that same kind of thing. You're kind of tempted and you kind of feel guilty that like we somehow kind of somehow move ourselves out of the environment where we're going to be tempted or move ourselves out of um, this fallen world, which you could make an argument that every moment we're in a fallen place, we're tempted uh, in some way or another. I need to talk, talk, stop talking with my hands because I just somehow, I'm not even wearing the mic and I got my glasses uh, tangled up in the mic. But, uh, but anyway, um, you know, we do need to note that. I think that's really, really important. Uh, for the guys in here, uh, the idea of, of being tempted to lust, and I, I shouldn't, you know what, I've, for all these years, I usually just focus on the guys if it's about lust. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in our culture, uh, women, the, 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 the women addicted to porn and the women looking at bad websites and the women buying movies in hotels, which used to just be what guys did. They don't even really offer that anymore. But um, the, those, those, tempta those sins among women are increasing as women have decided not to be women. I'm, I'm glad all of you women in here still want to be women. Um, but, but our culture is moving in a direction and it's actually showing up in stats like that. I mean, it used to be like, you could almost say 0% of women were addicted to porn. I don't know if you could say zero ever, but pretty much. And now it's, I don't know if it's creeping toward 50% or creeping toward a third, but it's, it's, it's really, really um, a sad uh, commentary on our culture. So I will open it up to everyone. Um, but where are the lines? And I don't think we're necessarily called to find these lines. Obviously, we want to stay away from sin. We want to be like Joseph. We want to run. But when does the temptation to lust become lust? And when does uh, lust become something, you know, even worse? Um, and so, you know, where are these? And again, we're, we're not called to draw the lines, but that it gets a little bit messy. If, I, if I'm tempted to lust, isn't there a sense in which maybe I've already lusted? I don't know. We're told Jesus was tempted in every way as we are. So there must have been a temptation to lust, but he just always shut it down, no, right away. Um, and obviously he wasn't tempted to speed in his car. It doesn't, every, in every way as we are, doesn't mean every little thing. Uh, he wasn't driving much. Um, but he was tempted. And that actually, if you're tempted to think temptation, that you should have guilt for it, that should give you comfort that, you know, hey, my Lord was tempted too. Uh, my Lord went through things like I go through things. And, and that's a great, a great thing. That's why he can be our great high priest. Hebrews goes into all, you know, he, he was a human being for a reason. Um, and obviously uh, the reason to uh, save us. Um, so there's a nurturing aspect here. So the, the temptation, there's a luring, there's an enticing and notice it's by one's own desire. Of course, Satan is active. He's trying to get us. The world is a messy, awful place, and it's trying to get us in its way, its aura. Um, uh, but we have our own desires, and that's what moves us into a place of sin. We don't want to nurture that desire. We don't want to pet it like we pet our cat or our dog. Uh, we don't want to... Uh, make it a pet. Uh, we don't want to do that. We need to not let it conceive and give birth to sin and sin. You know, we need to stop the, whatever level this is a process, we need to stop that process, uh, you know, right at the start. So let me uh, stop here for a second. Any, any comments about that? Any, um, anything you want to say that will <laughs> clarify what I said? Uh, Daniel, then Lori. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay. Okay. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Daniel was saying um, that, and maybe even for some of you back in here, uh, Daniel was saying uh, he, it just is comparable to the life cycle of, of a living being, uh, whether it's an insect or whatever it might happen to be. There's the conception, there's the, the birth, uh, the, the maturity, on and on and on. He talked about the, the troubles of a woman being pregnant, specifically his wife, Jenny. Um, and, you know, it is, it, it's hard work and, and we don't want, we want to stop it in the process. We don't want sin. We don't want temptation, enticement being allured uh, to move in that direction at all. Um, and then, uh, Lori, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Lori said, "We need to be doing things that make us that that lead to holiness, not to happiness." And we are a society that that wants you know instant gratification, but definitely a culture that wants gratification uh, to be moving uh, in that direction. Jennifer and I, when she got her COVID shot, uh, she was a part of a school teachers group of you know just a small group of 2,500 teachers that day. I think I don't know what the no, I'm kidding, but it wasn't that many. But I mean, it was unbelievable. It was so awesome too. She was in and out in 15. I mean, it, it was amazing. But on that high school, the motto for the high school is "Live in the moment." Okay, is that what any parent? That's the side of the building. That's the first thing they see. Okay, there are no consequences to anything in life. Live for the moment. I mean, is that what anyone wants any teenager reading every day? We, we were blown away by the side of that building. I mean, but that's, I mean, that's where our culture has moved, where we're even going to promote that among 15 to 18-year-olds. I mean, oh, anyway, it's just incredible. Uh, but Shannon, did you want to add something? Yes. It is a sin, I mean, at least from my understanding, that if you, you know, you're swimming past the bay, then you stick around. And, and yeah. that's something that I think we fall victim to at times is we like the feeling of being tempted, even if we feel like we're not going to take the And then the more bait comes around and then it takes us and it leads the other way. And I think that's something that a lot of times we kind of slowly get into that slippery slope without realizing. Yeah, that that what a great what a great point. All of them were great, but yeah, Shannon um, Shannon started talking. Shannon Wilcox, for those of you online, he was saying that the it, it starts talking about an actual fishing lure, an an actual lure, and you know, or at least in our context, you know, if we're gonna if we see the bait, and and Shannon, you said something really profound. Sometimes we like the feeling of being tempted. And I think that would definitely be a sin. <laughs> so, I'm seeking out that feeling of being tempted. But anyway, but, and, but if we if we see that bait and we keep swimming around that bait, you know, that that is not a good thing. And uh, James definitely uh, points that out. So anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you for that as well. Um, George Pryor, go ahead. What, let me turn this mic. Okay, go ahead. I'll preface this by maybe I watch too much Law and Order SUV, but it seems like this fully growing. Sometimes something can seem to start out basically normal, good boys like girls, but it can grow and morph into something unrecognizable. Is kind of my belief on that. I don't have statistics, but um, I watch Law and Order SUV, and it seems to be that way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, very, thank you, and you're right. I think that's, uh, that's true. We, we, we cannot fathom where Satan wants to take us. And, um, and you know, we, and we don't want to. You know, we, we want to stay as far away from that as we uh, possibly can. So uh, thank you for all those. The one thing uh, that Shannon's comment also reminded me of, something I wanted to say at the top, um, and you've probably already noticed, but the language 
in this first chapter of James, but particularly in 12 through 18, um, you know, we, we have the father of lights. We have uh, the lure and the enticement. And, and, and I, I didn't delve into the Greek words, but this idea of fully grown, that the word is parallel to the word mature up above. If not, I'm, I'm not going to say it's the same word, but, but they are parallel with each other in the opposite sense. You know, the mature in verses 1 through 11 is something we want. This maturity of the sin, obviously, we don't want. So there's a lot of compare and contrast through these verses as well. Really, really uh, amazing stuff and, and really vivid uh, for us uh, the way he does this. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Um, who led Jesus up to be tempted? Now, the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And the Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted, yes, to be tempted by the devil, yes, yes, but yeah, Bill, Bill Moore, with a little, what do you call him? Bible you, discoveries. Bible discoveries, yes, yes, and I'm surprised he just discovered that, no, I'm kidding, I, <laughs> I'm joking, I know, it's an oldie but goodie, all right, um, so the one commentary I looked at, and, and we're going to need to wrap up, we'll, we'll pick up wherever we drop off, we'll, we'll pick up next week, um, but points out four, and I kind of changed the wording of them. I, I, a few of the, the authors um, were written in, um, in terms of a quote, and some were just statements, and I made them all kind of quotes and actually uh, changed a few of them to things that we've talked about uh, here at Fishinger and Kenny. Um, but some of, the, some of the enticements of the world, some of the lies of the world, by the way, I have, a, I have a book in my office called Five Lies of the Century. It was written in the 90s, so it wasn't this century, but a lot of them still fit, but, and, and I'm sure a few of them are paralleled with some of the stuff here. But uh, um, our world, our society, the fallen environment we are in, will try to entice us, lure us to believe that this life is all there is. Um, and the way he worded it in his commentary was uh, the lure of success. Um, and I think in addition to some people's being very much enticed by success, materialism obviously is one of the things that uh, uh, we perhaps would be struggling with more than just a drive to uh, succeed in the world. Uh, they go hand in hand. Um, another lie that's really, really important for us to uh, not fall into is that there is no evil impulse in people. And this means that everyone can just do what they want, and we're making excuses for everyone to do whatever they want. Um, you know, sometimes uh, TV shows like um, Law and Order, as George brought up, or CSI, um, some of these crime shows, which are exciting because, you know, good's fighting evil, and usually in these shows, good wins. And um, so I, I like that, and I like the mystery, I like the suspense, I like the action. Um, but sometimes they're trying to figure out why and on these shows, a lot of times there is some kind of underlying reason, uh, hence their ability to try to figure out the motives and things like that. But sometimes people do things just because they want to do them. Sometimes people have sex with someone who's not their spouse just because they want to have sex with someone that is not their spouse. Um, and then, of course, definitely a higher level of, of mental problems would be someone who just wants to kill people. Um, you know, sometimes people just want to do bad things. Sometimes people just want to lie. You know, there, there's, not some, there, there's not some crazy thing underneath it. They just want to lie. And we have to realize that we, we have that within us. Hopefully in Christ, by his spirit and, by, and having been washed by the blood, you know, hopefully, you know, our just desire to sin is at, at least lessened. Uh, but Paul said, I do things I don't want to do. I don't do things I want to do. Paul struggled. We struggle, and there's an evil side. There is a fleshly side. Maybe evil seems too strong for us, um, but there's a side that just wants to be fleshly, and we need to fight that lie that there is no such thing. Um, and then, of course, just subjectivism in its entirety, uh, but the whole thought that sin is not serious or that sin isn't even real. You know, there are lots of people in our world who don't believe there's any such thing as a sin. There might be things that benefit society, things that don't benefit society quite as well. You may like doing some of the things that don't benefit the world. You know, I might not like you, but this is my truth. You can have your truth, you know, whatever. 
Uh, but sin is very serious, and sin is real. Yeah, but, but those people will not be able to define benefit. Well, not not appropriate. Not yes, logically they they shouldn't be able to. But yes, but they they still do. But but I mean, in their mind, of course. But you're correct. They cannot really do it uh, without a belief uh, in the structure that is reality, which is God and His creation. Um, and then. Um, We've, we've brought this up a time or two before. I think I have. I think Greg once or twice too, but, uh, um, or may, more, but maybe not with these exact words, but um, we, um, blaming God for stuff, uh, we need to fight that uh, lure, that uh, enticement from our world. Uh, the, the phrase that happened for a reason. Um, uh, not really a fair thing to say. Uh, the appropriate thing to say would be, you know what, and, and obviously if it's a, a death situation, probably the appropriate thing to say is nothing and just, just hug the person, be with the person, you know, that kind of thing. But if there's a discussion, the more appropriate thing is, you know what, God did know it was going to happen and God will bring good out of it. That's what the promise is. Um, it doesn't mean God wanted it to happen. It doesn't mean that there was some reason back before time began and God, you know, he wanted that four-year-old to be hit by the car because of the, the, the domino effect that would happen after, you know, no, no. God doesn't want anything bad to happen, ever. Now, does God know and does God bring good out of it? Yes, and that's what we can talk about. Um, but giving God any blame uh, for uh, evil or any blame in this context for temptation um, is, is obviously uh, inappropriate. God's power and his grace and his goodness that's why good can come out of bad. So uh, verse 16, I tacked on here, even though it's in the next paragraph in the ESV, just to show you that some versions do it this way. So do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, go ahead, Steve. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. I can't believe you couldn't see through my, the reflection in my glasses. <laughs> so anyway, do not be deceived. James does not want us tricked, and he doesn't want us tricking others. James is just down home, uh, giving us the truth. And that's what he uh, wants to do. That's what he wants us to do. We're going to stop right here. Uh, we'll pick up. We'll do 16 through 18 uh, next week. Let me bounce forward to a quote that I really liked. Uh, this is the author uh, of the commentary I was looking at. And I, I just think this is good. And I will, I will not reread it next week, but we'll look at uh, 16 through 18. The teaching of James 1, 12 to 18 might be summed up in this way. Since you were created by God with the full potential for truth and life, avail yourself of it and do not foolishly squander it or, or trace it for the false lure. If you stand firm in the midst of trial, if you do not capitulate, to the evil desire to blame God and thus engage in sin, you will receive the crown of life in the age to come and its foretaste in the present. Remember that God is trustworthy and wholly good, and this will sustain you in the midst of any difficulty. And I think that's just uh, really, really good. Next week, um, all this moves to really the faith and, and works kind of contrast already getting started here, even though uh, he uses those words in chapter three. Uh, but here, true religion is compassion and action. I'm going to ask Steve if you'll come up here and lead a prayer um, for both groups. Thank you for your attention, both groups. Thanks for your comments. Let's pray. God, Father in heaven, we're truly thankful for this time we could have had together to study your word. We are thankful that you're always with us and that when we pray to you, you answer our prayers. God, in difficult times and times of temptation and times when Satan is after us, we pray that you would help us to be strong. Help us to pray for your help. Help us to lean on you and help us to find the power in you and in Jesus. Help us to resist and help us to turn to your word. Help us to look to the example of Jesus so that we can be stronger and be more like Jesus every day. God, you, we pray that you'll be with us as we go through the rest of this week to help us to be faithful to you. Help us to, to be positive people, people that people will look to and want to be, be like us because of the love we have for each other and for the love we have for you. 
for the way we talk and the way we act as the best examples we can be. We're thankful for Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.